So oh, Benno, okay. we've uh, we've set the scene um, with uh, Huan and Chris, and uh, Roger gave it a bit of an insight into his uh, evolved disease story. Um, we've got patients on uh, live Facebook and uh, some patients here in the uh, webinar space. So um, welcome. Um, Benoit has been a great supporter of ours uh, for a number of years, um, a consultant cardiologist and also the president of the British Heart Valve Society. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. He texted me about, it was about what, 45 minutes ago saying that you're a mile away from the hospital and uh, how far are you away from the hospital now? Still a mile? In a mile. <laughs> Terrible traffic. But um, Ben, I was going to talk to you, uh, to the audience, about heart valve disease um, and uh, just to set the scene of, basically put a spotlight on the disease. Over to you, Ben. Thanks very much, Will. Good morning, everyone. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm very sorry for this. I'm parked up in a random car park in Southampton and hopefully won't be disturbed uh, whilst we're talking. Um, so uh, the British Heart Valve Society wor uh, works closely with Heart Valve Voice where we can. We both share the same goals, uh, which is to uh, improve care for patients with heart valve disease throughout the UK. Uh, and so um, we are very grateful to Heart Valve Voice uh, for organizing today. Uh, and I'm grateful to Will for the invitation to uh, speak to you all today. Um, so uh, I'm a cardiologist in Southampton and my areas of interest are in imaging of the heart, so taking pictures of the heart uh, and um, heart valve disease, which is what I'm going to talk to you about uh, for the next half hour or so. Um, so um, many of you will know that the heart's job uh, is to pump blood all around the body. Uh, and the heart does that uh, because the blood contains oxygen, which is what all of our parts of the body, the organs and the tissues need to get the energy uh, to do all of their jobs. Um, there are four valves inside the heart, which are constantly opening and closing. Um, when I'm talking to patients, I often explain heart valves as think of them as like a pair of gates, which constantly open and close and open and close. And when they open, it's uh, for a specific reason. It's because blood is supposed to move through them. So they're uh, like a gate opening so that things can pass through. And then when they close, they're supposed to close nice and tight so that they're shut firmly so that blood can't go back through the way that it just came. Um, so uh, when you actually do the maths and you realize how hard our heart valves work, uh, it is quite uh, in incredible. Uh, so every single time we have a heartbeat, there are some of the valves in the heart that were opening and others that were closing. So if your average person has about 70 heartbeats a minute, uh, when you do the maths, that comes to over 4,000 times that those valves were used in one hour. And then when you multiply that all up, it's over 100,000 times a day and nearly 37 million times a year. So exceptionally heavily used parts of the body. And uh, if these valves stop working normally, uh, what can happen is that uh, either your heart is placed under strain uh, or the right amount of blood that is needed around the body won't get there. And so that's a problem. Uh, thank you. So inside the heart, there are four valves. And we can divide these up. The heart really th has two sides to it, the left side of the heart and the right side of your heart. And there are two valves on each side. Uh, the left side of the heart has an aortic valve and a mitral valve. And the right side of the heart has a pulmonary valve and a tricuspid valve. Now, the valves on the left side of the heart are exposed to higher pressures than the ones on the right. And that's why it's far more common for us to see left heart valve disease in grown up adults. So the vast majority of people that have a heart valve condition in the Western world will have something wrong with either the aortic valve or the mitral valve, sometimes both. Of course, occasionally people do have issues with the other valves, but the main conditions that we see affect the aortic and the mitral valves. And 
again, if I go back to my analogy of gates, if you imagine that someone has some gates and they told you there's a problem with their gates, there's only really two things that can go wrong. Either when the gates are supposed to open, they don't open properly, or when they're supposed to close, they don't close properly. And that's exactly the same with heart valves. So when a heart valve is supposed to open, it's supposed to open nice and fully. And if it doesn't do that, and it's only opening a little bit, then it's become narrowed. And the medical word for narrowing is stenosis. So that's a narrowed heart valve. Equally, when the valve is supposed to close, it's supposed to close tightly and stay firm. But if it only closes partially, so there's a gap, then that gap would allow blood to leak through it. So a leaky heart valve is called a, a valve regurgitation. So the medical words are stenosis, which means narrowing, and regurgitation, which means leakage. Now, heart valve disease is uh, quite prevalent, actually, and it becomes more prevalent as we get older. I heard Will speaking earlier in the introduction about the Ox valve study, uh, which was a community screening study done in Oxfordshire, which confirmed a really quite significant prevalence of valve disease in people over the age of 60 to 65. Now, in that study, a lot of the valve disease picked up was only mild, but of course, over the years, that can progress to more uh, significant conditions, which we can talk about. So, as I mentioned previously, the aortic and the mitral valve being on the left side of the heart tend to be more affected. The most common valve condition that we see in the UK, the one which Chris Young said that he was just going off to see someone with, is a narrowing of the aortic valve, and that's aortic stenosis. It is by far the most common condition. In my practice, it accounts for up to two thirds of all the patients I see with a valve condition. The second most common condition in the UK is a leaking mitral valve, a leaky mitral valve, mitral regurgitation. The mitral valve can leak for lots of different reasons. A common reason is something called prolapse, but there are many reasons. And in general, mitral valve conditions we tend to see slightly earlier than aortic uh, narrowing, aortic stenosis. So this is really the key question. How do you know that you have or might have heart valve disease? And the challenge here that Will will have seen over the years with heart valve voice and the challenge for all of us that practice medicine is that none of those symptoms that is listed there is unique to heart valve disease or heart valve conditions. The most common condition symptom would be breathlessness on exertion. So people finding that they are becoming breathless doing activities that previously did not make them breathless before or people finding that if they're walking to the shops, they're having to stop to take a breather, which they didn't do before. But of course, we know that shortness of breath can be due to lots of things. And it's really important that if people are becoming breathless, that they don't ignore it. Too often in my practice, I will see patients that have attributed breathlessness quite simply to getting older. And of course, that is a possible explanation, but it is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to have made sure that there's nothing else wrong before you jump to that conclusion. That should not be anyone's first assumption. Depending on the valve condition you have, chest tightness or chest pain on exertion may also be a symptom. This is most commonly seen in aortic stenosis, the narrowed heart valve. And actually the symptom can feel a little bit like what we call angina, a pressure or a heaviness in the chest, which does not come on at rest, it comes on with effort and is relieved by rest. Sometimes if that aortic valve becomes really narrow, it can significantly reduce the amount of blood coming out of the heart. And on those occasions, exercise-related lightheadedness or dizziness 
or even blacking out after some form of exertion would tend to imply that the valve narrowing is uh, really quite significant indeed and something needs to be done urgently. So I would say a few times a year, I do see patients that have the sort of textbook story of walking up a flight of stairs at home, they get to the top of the stairs and the next thing they know they're coming around on the floor. So if someone has a blackout or a loss of consciousness or nearly blacks out during or immediately after they've exerted themselves, you absolutely have to think of the heart and in particular heart valve disease. And fatigue and difficulty in exercising are what we would call non-specific symptoms, meaning that they could be related to valve disease. Of course, they could be symptoms of something else. But certainly if people find that they are becoming much more tired and fatigued doing activity than they did before, in that individual, that might be their manifestation, their way of expressing the valve condition. So these are the symptoms that we need people to be aware of. So as you've already heard, the way in which we diagnose that somebody has a heart valve condition can start by listening to your heart. Under normal circumstances, blood flows through the heart smoothly. There is no turbulence, it's very smooth, and so you can't really hear any of the blood moving through the heart. However, if you have a narrowed valve or a leaky valve, the blood won't flow smoothly anymore and there will be turbulence. And we can hear that turbulence because it produces a noise which we call a murmur. So listening to the heart for a murmur is the first clue that somebody may well have a heart valve condition. If your GP listens to your heart and says that they can hear a murmur, you would normally then be referred on for further tests. And the main test that is performed is an ultrasound scan of the heart, which is called an echocardiogram. That's the same technology that is used to scan a pregnant woman to look at a baby, it's ultrasound, but rather than scanning the tummy, we put the probe on the chest and we scan the heart. And in most people, this allows us to see the valves of the heart very clearly, and it allows us to say whether the valves look normal, whether they're moving normally, are they narrow, are they leaky, but also if they are narrow or leaky, how much? So we can not just make a diagnosis, but we can also grade the severity. So is it mild, is it moderate, or is it severe? So this picture is of the aortic valve and is just designed to give you an example of what the valves can look like. On the left hand side of the screen, you can see a normal aortic valve in the top left, the valve is closed and you can see three pouches or three cusps, three aspects to this gate, so to speak. One on the top left, one on the top right and one in the middle at the bottom. So that's a normal aortic valve that's closed. And on the bottom left, you can see what that valve looks like when it is open. As we get older, in some people, the valves become thickened and hardened. And that's what the middle panel is designed to show, aortic stenosis. You can see that when that valve has opened in the middle panel at the bottom, you can see that that valve has not opened fully. And the reason it hasn't opened fully is because it can't, because those three leaflets or flaps of tissue are no longer soft and supple, they are hard, full of chalk or calcium and they won't move out of the way fully. So as a result, you can imagine if the heart now has to get all of the blood out of that valve, which is not opening fully, your heart is going to have to work harder. So it's put under greater strain. 
And on the final panel, on the right side, where it says insufficiency, that's another word for regurgitation or leakage. This is the valve that doesn't close properly. So you can see on the right hand panel at the top right, the valve which is supposed to have closed, but in fact has not closed properly. And you can see that that valve is open and there is therefore the potential for a leakage of blood. So blood that just left the heart when the heart squeezed is going to fall back into the heart again because that valve couldn't close. And as a result, your heart is going to have to work extra hard because it's having to do the same work twice, if that makes sense. So that's an overview of what heart valve disease is, what symptoms it can give people, and how we diagnose it. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, um, I've not been disturbed in the car park yet. So I'll, uh, I'll happily take any questions if anyone has any. I just thought I'd jump in first of all, if you didn't mind, Benoit. Um, it, we, we call it a progressive disease, but it's quite an unpredictable disease. But many people would say it can be a cliff edge as well in terms of going from um, moderate disease to severe disease. I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you see in, in clinic and, and how that progresses when with, you know, Roger has his uh, two year LIACO. Um, how, does, how does that kind of progression uh, play out in clinic? Yeah, as you say, Will, it, it is very variable. Um, it really is. So some people can remain within the moderate range for years, maybe even a decade or so. And in other people, uh, it can progress quite quickly. Um, and that's why you have to keep an eye on um, all people, really. That's why you have to keep an eye on people regularly. Um, so most people with a moderate condition, certainly a moderately narrow aortic valve, uh, will need to be seen every single year. Um, and of course, some patients, when you come back and you scan them, uh, will have exactly the same numbers as was measured the previous year, which is, of course, great. It's very reassuring. Um, but that wouldn't usually then be a prompt to say, oh, well, because it's the same this year, let's see you in three years. It, you, you can't really do that. Um, you know, you do need to keep a close eye on um, all of this. And uh, yes, within individuals, we do sometimes see accelerated progression of disease in some compared to others. Um, we don't really know why that happens. It is a subject of research. Um, but yes, you're right that certainly, um, and I can imagine from the patient's point of view, of course, when you transition from moderate to severe, it, you can always see on, on patients' faces that look of, oh my gosh, I've got something that's severe. I think there's a, a sort of a, a a safety sort of there's a safe feeling when you're told it's moderate because it doesn't sound too bad um, and then I think you're right that the first time people come to clinic I had a valve clinic on Tuesday in which two patients who had previously had a moderate disease had progressed over 12 months and were now within the severe category and although both remain absolutely fine with no symptoms at all of course you could see they were aware now that okay it's severe. It was almost as if it took that to register that, okay, this is going to need, need to be sorted at some stage. Uh, um, sorry, Sam, I'm going to just <laughs> crack yeah, up yeah, with another question on. that's link, linked to that, uh, Benoit. Uh, a question we had from Twitter. Do we have any advice on, on how to track the subtle changes in your health and the symptoms of breathlessness and fatigue? A couple with that, I wonder if you could just say a sentence or two on asymptomatic and symptomatic patients and then lead on to tracking those symptoms and then I perhaps I can mention some of the things that we do at Heart Bar Voice. Yeah I mean it, it, it's a very good question isn't it because of course um, I, I, I'm slightly wary about answering that because of course um, what we what we're keen not to do of course is to turn people into in, into into uh, people that are very anxious and are, and are sort of timing every single walk that they do and worrying that this walk took two minutes longer than it did 
previously and is that the first sign that I'm you know struggling and actually I, I think in general um, certainly talking to other people that you live with and certainly listening to other people I mean our, our overwhelming experience in clinic is that um, our male patients uh, like many of us men tend to uh, often adopt a sort of ostrich like head in the sand you know if I don't see the problem then it's not there um, and often they'll, they might tell us that they're okay and their partners might say well actually you know not really and then they'll say oh okay so I think I think certainly I would say listening to people that you live with is actually a really important thing because often they will observe things that you may not have done yourself mm -hmm. um, I, I, I mean it's a slightly separate topic but the whole keeping fit and keeping healthy will of course help ward off any of these symptoms for as long as possible anyway. Um, I know that, that Heart Valve Voice have done a lot of work with the symptom tracker. Um, do you want to talk about that? Because that, that's actually really, really helpful. Yeah, so, so currently we have a symptoms tracker on the website, but we'll also be launching very soon um, an app that patients can um, monitor those symptoms over time and again um, that was designed with patients with the professional societies to capture the fact that we wouldn't necessarily want this worried group of, uh, of a community running around tracking every single slight subtle change but it is monitoring it over time and the app will allow you to do that and then it will facilitate the sessions that you have with Benoit in your clinic um, to be able to provide really good evidence about the uh, about your disease. I noticed there was a, a question from Livy about what is peak gradient. Patients seem to hear a lot about what does peak gradient mean. And I know we can, um, and um, the, the, the DIV around the valve area. Oh, yeah. So um, those are technical phrases which are essentially related to uh, the numbers that we measure during that ultrasound scan of the heart, which allows us to then grade the narrowing or the leakage. So um, because the echo machine doesn't actually put anything inside the body, we can't actually measure a pressure. What we measure with the machine is how fast is the blood moving. That's what we measure. And, um, and, and, and so what the numbers are, the peak gradient is basically derived from that speed of blood. So the higher the peak gradient across the valve, the faster the blood must have been moving to get across it. So as someone's valve, if we take the aortic valve, for example, as the aortic valve gets more and more narrow, the blood is going to have to move more and more quickly to get through in the same time. So we can measure how quickly it's moving and we then use a formula to convert that into the peak gradient. The DVI is, it's a very technical thing. It's called the Doppler velocity index, but basically it's just a way of us expressing again, how severe is the condition. So we help to, we use that to help us in putting someone into the mild, moderate or severe category. Superb. Uh, we've got a question here from Heidi um, Pratchett um, around mitral regurgitation specifically, but she wants to know whether things can actually go backwards. Can you go from severe to moderate? So under very specific circumstances, the answer to that is yes, but in general, the answer is no. So let me explain. Um, there's probably only a very small number of times when that could happen. It depends it depends a little bit um, on, on, on the conditions that you are in when you are scanned. And what I mean by that is um, sometimes the first time that we find out that someone has a valve condition is if they were admitted to hospital um, and they might have been admitted with fluid on the lungs, what we call heart failure. So there's too much water, too much fluid in the body. We do know that if those people are scanned, whilst they've still got all the extra water on board, the leak can look worse than it actually is. Because we know that if we get all of that water out of the body, and believe it or not, sometimes it can be many kilos or even a stone or more of water, 
and then we repeat the heart scan, the leak could look better. So that's a specific and I guess unique example of when you might see that happen. But for your average outpatient that is living at home and is well, it would be very unusual to have a severe condition one year and then go back to moderate. That, that's not normally something we see, no. Um, if we've got any more questions, by all means, uh, put them through. Well, we've got you there, Benoit, as well. Um, uh, two years ago, we launched a, a gold standard of care report where we brought clinicians from across the UK to uh, look at the patient pathway. And one of the sessions later this morning is, is indeed on that patient pathway and how we can speed up various parts of the pathway to make sure patients get treated at the right time um, and they get the right, uh, the right type of treatment. I know British Heart Valve Society have recently launched a, a, a similar report, which I, I think is just excellent. I wonder if you want to just explain a little bit about British Heart Valve Society and the kind of work that often patients don't see that's, that's, that's going on about how we can refine and make sure the pathway is, is as best as it can be. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's a really good point. There's an awful lot of work, as you know, obviously, as the CEO of Heart Valve Voice, and I know for doing the same job for BHVS, there's a lot of work that, that, that goes on behind the scenes, uh, which is really trying to uh, improve all aspects of care, really, in primary care, secondary care, tertiary care. Um, the great thing, in a way, about for patients that are listening, the thing to know about and hopefully be reassured about is that with, with Heart Valve Voice and British Heart Valve Society, there's sort of a, a two-pronged attack, really, on, on, on all aspects of this. Because Heart Valve Voice very much focuses on, on, on patients and raising awareness amongst people, which is hugely important. Because, of course, you can't, in many cases, um, you, know, you need people to be aware of what heart valve disease is and what it can do. And then British Heart Valve Society... Uh, focuses very much on educating the healthcare professionals that will be looking after patients with heart valve disease. So we focus an awful lot of our attention on educating cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, nurse practitioners, GPs, cardiac pharmacists, physiologists, technicians, etc. So, so, so a lot of that work goes on. And you're right that um, Heart Valve Voice produced uh, the, the gold standard and this year um, it, the British Heart Valve Society launched uh, what's called essentially a blueprint, but it's essentially a, a document which is designed to promote network-based care, which is really trying to address some of the issues that we've had historically of barriers between primary and secondary and tertiary care. We still, in this day, we still have issues with patients having heart scans in the community which we can't then review in the hospital or we're doing work in the hospital and the patient may then move to another part of the country. And, and, and it's all still very, well, it feels at times very 20th century um, in terms of our communication. And so the, the blueprint really was put together to try to improve uh, network based care and to provide some, some recommendations for how we should map out heart valve disease care in the future looking at the way in which the care for patients is being revolutionized at the moment with minimally invasive surgical techniques, keyhole transcatheter techniques being improved all the time. Um, we're going to need a better way of doing things and we need stronger foundations. It's not really going to be okay to keep trying to add more and more on top without addressing the, the, the sort of the foundations of how it's done in primary care, because that's really where this all starts. Uh, without a good functioning joined up primary to secondary care system, um, it's not going to work. Simon, if you, can you see any other questions that have come through? I think some in the Q&A box. Yes, yeah, so there was, there was, uh... Um, a question about whether the mitral regurgitation can reverse and then the aortic stenosis that will always deteriorate. Have we covered that? That's uh, uh, an anonymous attendee asking, will aortic stenosis always deteriorate? I wonder how many patients with aortic stenosis 
will outlive the condition and how many might yeah. come to treatment? So that's a really good question. And unfortunately, the, the, the slight sit on the fence answer with that is it does depend a little bit on how old somebody is. So if you pick up mild aortic stenosis in an 85 or 90 year old, then it's very, very likely it is not going to cause them a problem during their lifetime. If you pick up mild aortic stenosis in a 50 year old, 60 year old, then actually, yes, it is more likely than not that it will cause them an issue at some stage, but that may not be for a decade or more. So um, the natural history of the valve condition in particular aortic stenosis is that yes, the valve does tend to narrow slightly with time but that time is usually measured in years and often many years. So it does depend upon how old someone is when we first find it mm. as to whether or not it's likely to cause an issue for them in their lifetime or not. Yes, I think the, um, our audience member has clarified the question saying my question was in the context of a one-year-old with mild to moderate AS, aortic stenosis. A one-year-old? That's unusual, isn't it? That's what the that's what the comment yeah. says. So, so, so I'm I, I'm an adult cardiologist rather than pediatric. But of course, what I can imagine is that if 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 you have um, so so I, I mean I suppose it's a good point that heart valve conditions that we've been talking about in general, we're talking about those that are acquired during life through aging. But of course, it is worth pointing out um, that some people can be born with a heart valve condition and congenital, which means you're born with it, congenital aortic stenosis most definitely does exist. We know that. So yes, if a one-year-old has a, is known to have a heart valve condition, I would imagine that that one-year-old would be under intermittent follow-up with a pediatric cardiologist. And yes, I would imagine that at some stage in their childhood, that may come to needing attention, but whether that would be at the age of five or 10 or 15, I, I'm afraid I, I, don't, I don't have the expertise to answer that because I've, I've not really done congenital heart disease in, in pediatrics. So, so we could, we, what uh, we will be doing is collecting all these kind of questions and putting them to an advisory panel so we can be able to, to pick up and we'll put uh, some general responses, obviously, um, on, online after the... The conference we wouldn't uh, be able to answer any specific uh, questions related to your specific care that should always go through to your clinician we've got and um, we've got quite a complex session next in that it is a live diagnostic so i want to finish absolutely on time and hmm. ben is probably getting a yellow sticker on his window screen uh, <laughs> shortly but the, the, we've got <laughs> two good yeah the two good questions i thought was what's the connection between uh, af and valve disease but also, could you just quickly explain a little bit more about a bicuspid valve, which again, a lot of patients pick up. And then I've seen a question from Brenda and Tim, which I think we can probably collect in the next session if, that's, if that would be possible. But if we could close out with those two, an AF question yeah. with valve disease and bicuspid valve. Yeah, sure. So I'll do bicuspid valve first. So the, the picture that I showed on my last slide had uh, an aortic valve with three cusps or flaps of tissue. So the normal aortic valve, so to speak, has three flaps, but it's a very, very common thing for people to only have two flaps of tissue in their aortic valve or two cusps, and that's called a bicuspid valve. Now a bicuspid valve is seen in at least 1% of people, and in some places up to one and a half. So one in a hundred people has a bicuspid valve. I mean, they're very common. So um, the reason that it's important to know about whether or not someone has a bicuspid valve is twofold. Firstly, because a bicuspid valve can be associated with uh, other issues within the heart. And in particular, it can be associated with an enlargement of the main blood vessel that comes out of the heart, the aorta. Um, but also because if someone has a valve with two cusps, a bicuspid valve, if it's going to develop a narrowing or a leakage, it tends to do that earlier in life. So um, whereas 
no, where is aortic stenosis in people whose valves have got three cusps often is seen in people in their 60s, 70s and 80s. A bicuspid valve is probably more likely to be the cause if you see someone who's got a narrow or leaky valve in their 40s or their 50s. Uh, so that's a bicuspid valve. And then, yeah, AF. So AF is an irregular pulse or atrial fibrillation. It's most commonly associated with conditions that affect your mitral valve, but it can be seen in any valve disease. AF can actually be caused by a million different things, but anything that affects your heart can be a cause of AF. And the reason that the mitral valve tends to be more often associated with AF is because one of the parts of your heart called the atrium, which is the upper part of the heart, tends to enlarge when you have mitral valve disease. And an enlarged left atrium is more likely to develop fibrillation. Uh, so yes, there is a link between AF and valve disease, um, just like there's a link between many types of heart disease and AF. Um, but yes, there's a definite link there. It, it, does that answer the question? I hope that's okay. okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Benoit. I think uh, you deserve an extra brownie point for uh, uh, delivering a presentation from your car. I don't know if that's a first for you. Um, well, it's a first, and I, I must say, because I've kept the because I've kept the doors shut to make sure I'm not disturbed. I'm absolutely roasting. Hot. I'm roasting in here as well. Yeah. Uh, very well done. Very well done indeed. Thank you so much, Benoit. Fantastic presentation. Done.